Good afternoon. How are you? Well, there's no rain today. It's in the 50s, so it's a little chilly. There's no wind, so it's pretty pleasant, and the light is brilliant. So that's the Thomas Jefferson weather report for the day. Um, I've been writing, but with uh, MSNBC and other stations in the background, so I've heard the various statements made. Um, there's some fictions that go on. Um, the, the worst fiction is that there can be a good or bad way to war. How do you have a civilized war? What, what rules do you obey by? I mean, do we march as the British once did toward another enemy and then we shoot at each other and those up front are most likely to die? Is it permissible to terrify your enemy by doing ravages on bodies and leaving them around? Uh, when did we decide we could pull the heads off babies to intimidate the citizenry against resisting us? That's supposedly what Hamas did in, uh, in Israel. But if you destroy somebody up close and personal like that, showing how heinous and evil you are, and evil was the word that Biden used for Hamas against Israel. But if you're tearing up entire neighborhoods and burying civilians and killing them and saying you're doing the best you can in a densely populated area, what can you say? And is it ever right to go into the history that you think justifies having this war? Well, all those are tough questions, and they're kind of irrelevant because uh, this has a force of its own. And I think that the feeling I have is that the superiority of Israel, now that they have their war footing, uh, that they, they can decimate in all directions everything there is to destroy. Um, and that's one way to end a war. And you create, of course, all those people, whoever after, want to come for you, the survivors. And I guess there is the notion that that's why you don't want survivors. You want people so intimidated they wouldn't think to challenge it. And uh, I've seen, seen people making arguments about the justification for destroying one another. And when, it's not even to say the dust, when, when this is over and the finger pointing continues for years and the justifications are argued, what have we accomplished? I guess we can all be glad that we're not, quote, in this war, although we're going to send forces that is perhaps by air from battleships perhaps on the ground, supply weapons as well. Uh, there's no question that this is going to be a miserable time. And every day we're going to hear stories about the people suffering, probably on either side. Uh, and the ones that we'll talk about will be the ones that seem the most innocent. Probably won't talk to a general explaining why historically... They tried everything else the Hamas did, and this is all they can do. Although I believe their constitution says that they exist to kill and destroy Israel. And the Israelis have been talking about a two-state solution, which doesn't seem to have any ground among those that are necessary to the agreement. You can get everybody in the area, perhaps, to agree, because, frankly, I think they'd rather do oil business than fight wars. They'd rather supply others to do what they're doing. Also, there's a, there have been writings about how wars are always defensive. That is, no matter who starts it, that can even be a defensive war. In fact, uh, Netanyahu at one point talked about the kind of anticipatory war, the defensive war, 
something we know is going to happen rather than wait, and so we strike. Now, I have to say, as a kid in the Bronx, when people would trade the oh yeah slang to each other, <laughs> leading inevitably to a fist fight, my view was if somebody says oh yeah to you, you immediately start the fight. You, you have that advantage. But what about on a larger scale in which you're not just trading slaps and fists? You're actually demolishing people. I was in a fight with a kid. I have no idea what it was about. <laughs> it's an Irish guy. He was a really good fighter. And we had a circle of people watching us. And I was hitting him, and he stopped hitting me. And I stopped, and I said, why, <laughs> why aren't you hitting me? And he said, because I had some blood in my eye. And so then everybody gathered around, looked at my eye. We went to a local pharmacist and we decided, or the pharmacist decided for us, that what had happened is I'd popped a capillary and so my eye would have some blood in it or visibly have blood in it and then it would heal itself, which is what happened. So even kids without any sophisticated appreciation for conflict and being friendly stopped. You know, the fist fight they wanted to watch between two people who were mad at whatever we can't remember, but not enough for the guy I was fighting with to be concerned about my well-being. War isn't like that at all. War is just miserable. Nothing's ever the same after war if you come within the propinquity of it, even by policy. And... It is proof positive that we have a base nature that is not governed by thinking, is not governed by love, is not governed by empathy, uh, is not a peace-seeking mass of walking, thinking flesh, but really more emotive than reasonable. I've asked people from time to time if they know what... Uh, Irish Alzheimer's is. And uh, now you out there guessing. <laughs> uh, you forget everything but the grudges. If that's not a definition for the Middle East, in every religious war I've ever seen. The uh, books that talk about war starting, starting with lies. You know, I think of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. We think about in... Uh, Iraq, the weapons of mass destruction, remember the main, you know, all these things are to justify a nation state going to war. Uh, someday people will explain to me what we were doing in Vietnam. But I do understand, and it's the one exception that I can think of in my life, other than, you know, what I understood about the wars that my dad and his and my uncle and the family were involved in I look at the wars in my lifetime and Ukraine somehow seems like the only one that makes sense and perhaps because it's hearkening back to World War II so do we help the world when we fund these things do we fund these things because of the oil in the region do we fund these things because we share bigotry? Do we uh, shun peace because war is more profitable? Will this war be contained because the economic interest of the people in the region, whatever their discriminatory foundation is, they'd rather have business work than to have this go on this way. And uh, I think Biden has done something interesting. Uh, I mean, he's, he's got a graduated way of being involved and in helping Israel, our ally, in this uh, unfortunate collision of people hating each other. And you can say for good reason or not, depending on what you know about it. But his uh, 
announcement was that he was going to, in my opinion, mix the all the good and the bad in terms of choices, which is to ask Congress, which right now is adrift at sea because it doesn't have a speaker, to approve funds that would go for both Israel and for Ukraine. Now, that's going to be a hard pill for some of these people to swallow. So that's something to watch out for. The uh, trial taking apart Trump's businesses and showing them for the sham and him for the con that he is, is in its second week. And he was in court, and I don't know if the picture was last week or this week, but it's lit in such a way that there's a commonness about Trump. It's like the portrait of Dorian Gray has come out of the closet and is now sitting in a courtroom. I'm sure you remember Dorian Gray was the portrait that it took on all of the pain and suffering and its features this painting did while the actual Dorian Gray continued to be young and perfect. So Trump seems to have the opposite. I mean, a man his age defending against the things that he is these are crushing. I don't care how much resolve you have, how much energy you have. This, is, this has got to tear anybody apart. And I'm sure he is. You know, he presents this persona as he has his whole life about how everything's just turning up roses, and it's not. So we're in a, we're in a dark period, and the question is, how will we come out of it? Will we come out of it well? And uh, it'll be a mixed, uh, a mixed outcome. I think that Trump will ultimately collapse into the abyss of irrelevance and, a sim and, and become a symbol of all this wrong with America. And that others who constantly resolve to point to what's wrong will bring us home. But it's clear that this kind of civil war is going to be ugly, but in a different way than those who would shred and tear apart a human being that once was a mother, a son, a husband, a father. I understand the emotional grieving that we hear and see on the air, but those who grieve are manipulated to make the war, to make it continue, to justify outrages on the other side of the table. It's kind of a deadly ping pong in which we trade assaults and outrages back and forth, and we do it within days of Halloween and trick-or-treat. I don't see any treats for a while. So, sorry <laughs> to talk about this nonsense. And it's not, not, well, it is nonsense. It's without sense. And all through history, we write about it, we talk about it, we see movies about it, people write poems about it. But we seem unable, as thinking, walking protoplasm, to do anything about it. So, I say uh, goodbye to you on my <laughs> trail outside. More and more leaves are turning orange. They'll start being beautiful. It's another painting of what's good about the world, that the nature around us can give us such gorgeous visions and a bath of pure reality that arms us for what we have to do in a world that seems at every turn to try to destroy what's beautiful 
and cooperative and close and communal and patient and loving. But, so, we'll work it out. So goodbye from my <laughs> Cathedral of Trees until tomorrow. Bye-bye.